Okay, I started and stopped accidentally. So I'm sorry that we didn't get to see each other face to face today and that you had some internet problems, but I decided why don't I just record the stories I was going to read, it gives me a little bit more time and you can watch them and stop and start um, as uh, your time in class allows. So here we go. This is the true story of a man who dared to be different, dared to rebel, and dared to stay dry. Hmm. Takes place a long time ago. What is something that many people, more adults than kids, but something that people carry with them on a rainy day? Exactly. Umbrellas. Well, umbrellas were not always in fashion. Now, many of us think of England as a place where people always have an umbrella with them because the weather is often wet. This is the story of, hopefully there's not too much reflection. You can see the story of Jonas Hanway's scur scurrilous, scandalous, shockingly sensational umbrella by Josh Crute. Whoa, those are umbrellas in all kinds of situations. Mild rain, windy rain. Okay. Now, there's a happy little cat who has taken shelter under an open umbrella. Okay, so this takes place in the 1700s. London was a rainy place, no matter which way you said it. On some days, it drizzled. Some days, it just mizzled. And on other days, it pelted and showered and spat. But it was wet. Beautiful illustrations, huh? Now... On a rainy day, kind of like in New York, the taxi cabs do really good business because people don't want to get wet, especially if they didn't expect rain and left their umbrellas at home. Well, the same thing happened in England at the time of the horse and carriage. When that happened, the only options were to stay indoors, travel by coach, or just get wet. And the people who could afford it traveled by carriage. Uh-oh. Do you look like a happy guy? I don't think so. This was James Hanway, and he did not agree. He was a grumpy man, kind of looks it, doesn't he, who disliked change as a general rule. He liked everything to be the same and predictable. When somebody became popular that he didn't like, excuse me, when something became popular that he didn't like, he was never quite about it. He would write hmm, on tea, the subject of tea, oh, considered as pernicious to the health, obstructing industry. When asked, let's see what else. Uh, and and, he, he, and pota politics. He had opinions about everything. And I'm not going to read upside down, but he did not like change. Let's put it that way. But there was one thing that Jonas liked less than change, and that was getting wet. That's the sign for wet. Ugh. On rainy days, he would pull on his thickest boots, button up his sturdiest coat, and throw on his largest hat. Yep, no matter how fast he walked, we know what happened. Eventually, he's going to get wet. Or whichever route he took. When he arrived at his destination, Ugh, look how he looks. His socks were soggy, his shirt was soaked, and his wig <laughs> looked like a wet cat. Not a good look. This simply will not do, he said. And guess what? He left London to find a place where it didn't rain as much. Well... He traveled the world, searching for a place where it never rained. You might be thinking a desert or a dry place, right? Well, that's exactly where he landed. He came to Persia, 
And there in the court of the Shah, the king, doesn't rain too much in Persia, in the Middle East. He came upon a very strange thing. He thought it was scurrilous, scandalous, shockingly sensational. Or was it? It was the, that's right, the umbrella, the parasol. What were these people using an umbrella for? Not the rain. Somebody said the sun? Exactly, to keep the sun off them. In reality, it wasn't so strange. You see, umbrellas were very ancient. They could be found in cities all over the world. Perhaps that's Paris. They were known for doing things ahead of everyone else but definitely not in London. London, those folks did not like change either. The people of London thought it was silly, foreign, and frilly. It's not what we do, they said. But now Jonas Hanway did not agree. So one particular Mizzly, drizzly, pelting, showering, spitting day, a scurrilous, scandalous, shockingly sensational thing happened. Okay, there he is. There's Jonas stepping out of his house on a rainy day. What do you think he's carrying with him? I think I heard you say, yeah. Jonas stepped out of his house on Queen Square with, ta-ta-da, an umbrella. I don't know what that sound is. Maybe it's the heat. Ladies gasped. Ah! Gentlemen frowned. Children giggled and asked, Mom, what is that? What does he have? But does he look happy? He certainly does. Because for once, on a rainy day, he's not going to have to get into a coach and he can walk to where he's going and stay dry. But when Jonas got to his destination, his socks were warm, his skirt shirt was dry, and his wig looked like a fluffy cloud, just as it should. And he said, this will do. Jonas began to carry his umbrella everywhere he went. Whenever he passed people, they would laugh and say, ha ha, there goes that mad Jonas Hanway. They felt sorry for him. But did he care? Check out his face now. A little rain? So what? Don't have to pay for a coach, and I am going to stay dry. But the coach drivers were not laughing. Uh-oh. And they said, this simply will not do. If everyone carried umbrellas, then who would need us? Who would need coaches when it rained? They were very upset. And they were seriously upset. You're not going to believe this. They jeered Jonas, said nasty things to him. They threw rubbish or garbage at him, and one coach even tried to run him over. Can you imagine people being that way? <sighs> but that would not stop Jonas. He carried that umbrella for 30 years. So fast forward, and here he is, an older gentleman, 30 years later, still carrying his umbrella. A scurrilous, scandalous, shockingly sensational thing happened that surprised even Jonas. It took a long time. Maybe some people are slow to change. But he started seeing another umbrella pop on the, on the street, and then another, and another, and another. It took a minute or a year, or a few years, but soon umbrellas were seen everywhere. Dotting the city from Greenwich Park to Hampstead Heath, all over London. Today, London is still, there's London, beautiful picture of London, and still a rainy place. 
but no matter which way, no matter which way you say it, on some days it tipples. On some days it dripples. On other days it plothers and lutters and chucks. The people have changed, the weather has not. But thanks to Jonas Hanway and his sensational umbrella, the people of London stay dry. It's just what we do, they say. Sometimes you have to have a belief in your idea, right? And stick with it. So if you ever take this book out, if you want me to bring it to your classroom, I'd be happy to. And it will give you a brief history of umbrellas from the 2000s to the 1500s BC to 1997. Okay. So I have another one before we read a ghost story because you can turn this on, turn it off at your leisure. And as your, again, as your schedule allows. After the Fall by Dan Sentat. Hmm. How Humpty Dumpty got back up again? Oh, yeah. That does look like Humpty Dumpty. And for those of you who sort of remember the rhyme, let's do it again together. Join me if you can. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And who knew there would be a sequel? Let's find out what happened to Humpty after the fall. This is the story of how Humpty Dumpty got back up again. Hi, my name is Humpty Dumpty. This used to be my favorite spot on the wall. I know, I know, it's an odd place for an egg to be, but I loved being close to the birds. Maybe because birds come from eggs. Then one day I fell. I'm sort of famous for that part. Folks called it the Great Fall, which sounds a little grand. It was just an accident, but it changed my entire life. Fortunately, all the king's men did manage to put me back together again. And he went to King's County Hospital, even though the rhyme says all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Well, they could put together most of me. Aw, poor Humpty. Why is he sleeping on the floor? Oh. In order to get into his bed, what does he have to do? He has to climb the ladder. Well, there were parts of me that couldn't be healed, even with bandages and glue. After that day, I became afraid of heights. And there he is shopping. And his favorite cereal is on the top shelf. But he won't climb up to get it. I was so scared that it kept me from enjoying some of my favorite things. Sleeping in my bed, getting my favorite cereal. <sighs> I walked past that wall every day and I would think about climbing that ladder again. I really miss the birds and being high above the city, but I could never do it. Maybe some of us know about being afraid to do something and wanting the courage to do it, but finding it hard to get the courage or muster up the courage. But what a great feeling when you finally do it. And when we get together next time, maybe you'll tell me some examples of things that you had to dig deep and find courage to do. And you did it. And you figured out it wasn't that bad. I could never do it because I knew that accidents can happen. I eventually settled for watching the birds from the ground. It wasn't the same though, but it was better than nothing. And then one day, an idea flew by. So there's Humpty looking through his binoculars and he spies a what? A paper airplane. Now what idea is that giving him? Making planes. 
by the way, is harder than I thought. It was easy to get cuts and scratches, but day after day I kept trying and trying and trying and trying. Trying to make a plan. Until I got it just right. Wow. That's a beauty, isn't it? That's amazing. My plane was perfect, and it flew like nothing could stop it. I hadn't felt that happy in a long time. It wasn't the same as being up in the sky with the birds, but it was sure close enough. He did create a beautiful bird, right? Unfortunately, uh-oh, accidents happen. What do you think happened to his bird? They always do. Darn that wall. There goes his bird straight for the wall. I almost walked away again. But then I thought about all the times I had, all the time I had spent, oh, good news. The plane, his bird, is on the top of the wall. How can he get it? Only one way. Oh, up the ladder. There he goes. I thought about all the time I'd spent working on my plane and all the other things I'd missed. I decided I was going to climb that wall again. But the higher I got, the more nervous I felt. I didn't want to admit it. I was terrified. I didn't look up. I didn't look down. I just kept climbing one step at a time. Can you see the lines around his hand? I think they're shaking. Oh my goodness. Until he made it to the top. I was no longer afraid. I did it. I did it. Maybe now you won't think of me as that egg who was famous for falling. But uh-oh, uh-oh, what's happening? He's cracking. Cracking? Hopefully you'll remember me as the egg who got back up and, oh my goodness, what happened? The bird inside came out. He said, the egg who learned to fly. Wow. The end. Some people have very cool imaginations. I really like this story. Okay. Turn this off if you get scared easily. It's a little scary. Maybe I'll give you two scaries. This is from a collection that we've read in the past, or maybe some of the thir third and fourth graders remember. It's Here They Be Ghosts by Jane Yolen. This one is called Night Bulbs. No pictures. When we moved into the house on Brown's End, I knew the night wolves would move with us and the bear. They had lived in every bedroom that I'd ever had. The one in Allentown, the one in Phoenix, and the one in Westport. <clears throat> the wolves lived under my bed and the bear in my closet. They only came out, you got it, at night. I knew, I absolutely knew that if I got out of bed in the middle of the night, I'd be a goner. You couldn't begin to imagine how big that bear was or how many teeth the wolves had. You couldn't imagine, but I could. Mm -hmm. So I put the bear trap I had made out of Legos and paper clips in front of the closet. And I put the wolf trap that I had built out of my brother Jensen's broken pocket knife and the old Christmas tree stand at the foot of my bed, just in case. And I kept the nightlight on, even though I was 10 when we moved to Brown's End. 
That meant, of course, that no one dared come into my room in the dark, not mom or Jensen or even that dad, though we rarely saw him for ever since he married Kate and none of my friends stayed overnight. It was safer that way. Of course, the minute that it got to be light outside, the wolves and the bears would disappear. I never did figure out where they went. And then I could go to the bathroom or get a new book from my bookcase, or I could even sit on the floor and put on my socks, anything, which meant winters were tough because it gets dark so early, especially now that we're living in the North, the dawns come so late and all. In Phoenix once when I was eight, I was sick to my stomach and I really had to go to the bathroom. I waited and waited until it was almost too late. And then I made a dash over the foot of my bed I managed to get out of the room in one big leap. leap. My heart was pounding so loud that it sounded like a rock band was inside. But I had to spend the rest of the night curled up in the tub because I could hear the wolves sniffling and snuffling around the bathroom door waiting for me. So when we moved to Brown's End without my dad, I expected the wolves and the bear. I just never expected the ghost. I heard it on the very first night, a kind of low sobbing. Ooh, 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 ooh. The wolves heard it too, and it made them nervous. They rushed around under my bed, growling and scratching all night, trying to get past the trap. The next night, the bear heard it too. He thrashed around so in the closet that when dawn came, I opened the closet door and my best sweater and my confirmation suit fell to the floor. By the third night, the low sobbing turned into a cry that came from across the hall in the room where my mother slept. And then I was really scared. Mom, I called out. I usually don't like to do that for fear of reminding the wolves and the bears that I'm in the room with them. And then I called out a little louder. <coughs> Excuse me. Mom? Mom? She didn't wake up. She didn't call back to tell me that everything was all right. So then I did something I never, ever do. I called for my brother Jensen, who was in the next room. Ever since Phoenix, we had our own rooms. I hated to call for him because he always teases me anyway, calling me a baby for needing a nightlight. A baby? He's only 11 years old. But Jensen didn't wake up either. In fact, I could hear him snoring. If only I could snore like that. I bet, I bet there wouldn't be any wolves or bears in my room. It would scare them away. I tried to sleep, but the ghost sobbing came again. I put the pillow over my head, but somehow that made it worse. I stayed that way until dawn. I didn't get much sleep. At breakfast, I asked, do you suppose this house is haunted? Jensen snorted into his cereal, but mom put her head to one side and considered me for a long while. Hmm. Yeah, haunted, Jensen said, by the ghosts of the wolves and a big ugly closet bear. I had made the mistake of telling the family about them when I was littler. <clears throat> and back when we were family. Dad had teased me too, and so had Jensen. Jensen? Mom warned. So I didn't bring it up again. Not at breakfast, not at dinner either. <coughs> Excuse me. But when we went to bed that night, I borrowed two pieces of cotton from my mom's dresser and stuck them in my ears. Then I brushed my teeth, went to the bathroom, and jumped into bed. It's when I hit the bed the first time at night that the wolves know it's time to wake up and the bear. Mom came in and kissed me goodnight. She turned on the nightlight and turned off the overhead. Leave the door open, I reminded her. Not that she ever needed reminding. And I lay down and I quickly fell asleep. It was just past midnight when I woke up. The wolves and the bears were quiet. It was the ghost sobbing so loudly in mom's room that woke me up. I was surprised that it hadn't wakened her. But then she doesn't hear the wolves or the bear either. She says that since I do, I'm a hero every time I get into bed. 
I know I'm no hero, but I'd sure like to be. The ghost went on and on and on, and I began to wonder if maybe the ghost was dangerous, bad enough that dad was gone. If anything should happen to mom, I thought about that for a very long time. After all, the foot of my bed was even closer to the door than it had been in Phoenix, and I was bigger. Okay. Hmm. I pulled the cotton out of my ears. The sound of the crying was so loud that it seemed as though the whole house shook with it. How could anyone sleep with that racket? I sat up in bed and the wolves began to growl and the bear began to push the closet door open, which squeaked a little bit in protest, inching out against the trap. And just then mom's voice came, only terribly muffled. Pete, she cried. My name and dad's name, only dad wasn't there. That's when I knew that the wolves and bear or no, I had to help her. I had to help my mom. I was her only hope. Oh, there is one picture I'll show you in a minute. Get back, you suckers. I shouted at the wolves and threw cotton balls down. They landed softly on the floor by the bed and the muzzled wolves. Shh, they were quiet. They listened to me. Leave me alone, you big overgrown rug. I called to the bear, flinging my pillow at the closet. The pillow thudded against the door, jamming it. Without thinking it through any further than that, I jumped from the bed foot and landed running through the doorway. Two steps brought me into my mom's room. And that's when I saw it, the ghost hovering over her bed. It was all in white, a slim female ghost in a long dress and a white veil. And she was crying, crying. Why? I said, my voice shaking. Why are you here? Who are you? The ghost turned toward me and slowly lifted her veil. I shivered, expecting to see maybe a a shining skull and dark eye sockets or a monster with weeping sores. I don't know, maybe even a wolf's head. But what I saw was like a faded photograph. It looks like a bride. Wow. It took me a moment and then I understood. And then I knew the ghost wore my mother's face, my mother's wedding dress. She was young and slim and beautiful. Behind me in my room, the wolves had set up an awful racket. The bear had joined in the snuffling and the snorting. When I looked, I could see red eyes glaring at me at the door's edge. The ghost caught her breath and shivered. It's all right, I said. They won't hurt us. Not here. I put my hand out to her. And don't be sad. If you hadn't gotten married, where would I be? Or Jensen? The ghost looked at me for a long time, considering, and then lowered the veil. Pete, honey, my mom's voice came from the bed, sleepy yet full of wonder. What are you doing in my room? Being a hero, I guess, I said to her as the wedding ghost and to my, excuse me, I said to her and to the wedding ghost and to myself, you are having an awfully bad dream. Not a bad dream, sweetie, a sad dream. And then I remembered I had you and your brother and it was all happy again. Do you want me to walk you back to your room? I looked over at the doorway. And guess what? Your red eyes were gone. Nah, I said. Who's afraid of a couple of night wolves and an old bear anyway? That's kid stuff. I kissed her on her cheek and watched as the ghost faded into the first rays of dawn. I think I'm going to like it here, Mom. I marched back into my room 
I picked up the trap from the foot of my bed and then the one from in front of the closet door. I heard whimpers, like a litter of puppies coming from under the bed. I heard a big snore from the closet and I smiled. I'm going to like it here a lot. The end. Well, I hope you enjoyed those three stories. I hope to see you again next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.